Um, mornings, I'd like to word, welcome all of you on behalf of Dottie. Dottie is at a wedding this weekend, so she's doing something fun. Um, so on behalf of Dottie and the pastors of UDLC, um, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the new year of living faith. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Elizabeth Kosakowski. I lead Bible study on Wednesday, and I help with um, the adult faith formation and recruiting and training of worship leaders. Um, but basically, the most important thing here at UDLC in the last few years that we've been emphasizing is that everything that we do, our educational and spiritual offerings, are grounded in our baptism. Um, our whole identity as Christians is grounded in our baptism. Through baptism, through God's grace, we die to our old way of being and we rise to a new way of life. We are called to see the world in a new way through the eyes of Christ. As Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And that is the goal of living faith, to be continually transformed through the speakers we have, the scripture or articles we read, the experiences we share, so that we may go forth into our families and communities and truly live out our faith. Fred Loomis, who's part of our UDLC diversity, equity, and inclusion team, will be speaking with us today, encouraging us to live out our faith in the light of Christ. His topic is celebrating diversity in the community of faith. It's a very timely topic, both for our congregation as we continue to live out our mission, and also for each of us as we interact with the larger community of our towns, our schools, our work and country. Today's reading from Romans was very pertinent. Paul poses the question, why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? And he concludes, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Each of us will be accountable to God. So may we listen with open ears and open minds to the scriptures and to what Fred has to say to us today. So thank, thank you. you thank you so much, Elizabeth. That's a wonderful, wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. So it's an honor and a privilege for me to share this time with you, with you wonderful people at UDLC this morning. <laughs> I feel disadvantaged. I can't see your wonderful faces and the accents of my words, but uh, I'm so happy to be here. Actually, these days, I'm happy to be anywhere. <laughs> so only, only old people can really appreciate that. And an old joke for old people, but in my case, it's very true. And uh, originally our talk was going to be just to give you an update on what we're doing with the DEI team and reflecting on the work that we did with Reconciling in Christ and that team over the past two years. But Dottie came up with this title, which uh, I, I liked it, uh, Accepting Diversity in the Community of Faith. You can see I've made some edits. I'm still editing. Uh, so I got feedback about that, which was wonderful that what we really need to be about is embracing diversity. So I, we put that out there, and then we got some more feedback. And I asked for it, and I said, what about this? And what we really, our end goal, I think, is how do we celebrate? How do we celebrate diversity in the community of faith? And I posed this question. PowerPoint's not supposed to be a lecture, but just as a stimulus for conversation. So I hope, hope we can do that in the time we have. But how can our community expand our welcome, be inclusive, and practice graceful engagement. So I'm going to get you thinking about this right away. Hopefully I can, there we go. So just think about this question. Why do we come to this church each Sunday? Rick Warren, greatness. Why on earth am I here? Why on earth am I here this morning? Why do we choose to come to this church in particular on this Sunday, right? So I've, I, was, I feel honored that you came to this talk. So that's uh, it goes without saying, but it could be the beautiful sanctuary we have, or uh, this worship space outside many of us came from, or the opportunity Ruth is with us online to be able to live stream the services and this talk. But 
how would you respond to this question? Anybody want to share? The people, the people, of the community. Um, I, I when when we couldn't worship here, I really, really miss that. Yes. About being together, friends, and talking with them, and taking communion. I mean, it's very lonely taking communion at home all by yourself. <laughs> it's, <laughs> not, it's not real. <laughs> Yeah, last one. So it's the community. I see some head nodding. Any any other? I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go to that. And I, I also come to be fed. I really find. I mean, I'm fed from the worship and 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 fed from God's word and the sentiments and the sermons, you know, uh, so that I kind of feel energized to move forward with the rest of my week. Mm -hmm. And of course, fed by all of you know, people, for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. I also really like the outreach part of it, you know, we're doing things just in the community, but also outside of the community and looking, looking outward. Exactly. Right. Okay, well, I kind of anticipated your response. Because I think it's in the chapter that, like, we come here to be in the company of others to experience God's love, okay, grace, and we get spiritual nourishment and, um, I, I do think that's how we experience God's love mm -hmm. is through people who share the faith in him. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm uh, still teaching. I teach uh, uh, in the education program at Gratz College, Jewish College in Monroe's Park. And I teach at uh, Newman University in uh, near Media, Franciscan Catholic institution. Uh, I'm still trying to find a Lutheran college that will hire me. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been successful yet, but uh, <laughs> I'm really, I'm teaching teachers who are their best students to have because they always complete their assignments on time. Uh -huh. <laughs> they always listen and they ask critical questions because I guess they're getting those, those questions from their, uh, from their students each day too. So I know we have many educators in the room. <clears throat> so here, here's some learning goals for today. Explain the work of our DEI team and listen to your ideas. So we're just getting started and we're trying to gather uh, input and uh, establish an agenda for UDLC. I want to talk a little bit about this idea of unconscious bias, because that's the first thing that came up and when we had our initial meeting of the DEI team. How can we train people on unconscious bias, particularly the leadership of the church? We can't take for granted that people that serve on church council even our pastors and staff have a full understanding and appreciation of unconscious bias and what I would call inclusive leadership, right? And then understand the meaning of graceful engagement, how we can practice this skill each day. This came out of our Reconciling in Christ work. It was one of the major tools. How do we talk to other people and practice this idea of graceful engagement? So I want to explain what that means uh, and how maybe we can practice that more. And then share ways we can embrace our differences, expand our welcome, and celebrate being a more inclusive and loving church. So I have uh, free to be you and me. My, my daughter's here. And she'll remember that we've been talking about this issue for a long, long time, right? So free to be you and me was something that came out, uh, started by Marlo Thomas, from a conversation she had with her niece about gender roles and stereotypes. It became a TV special, an album, a book. And it was something that the Erden High Elementary School did in the, when Jennifer was there uh, in the early 80s. And she had a part in that production as an elementary school student. She went on and, and uh, had other stage, had the lead in the high school play when we uh, were living at State College. So, But this was her introduction, I think, to theater. And, uh, and I still remember, what was, her, what was your line? Yeah. I'll dress your cat in an apron just because he's learning to bake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I have a distance image of William and his doll, which was a song in that as well. So anyway, even the Lutherans have been trying this reconciling Christ thing since 1974. Okay, so we've been at this business. It's new to UDLC, but we've been doing it, I think, for a long time. Right. Do you know that they updated the song, Free to Be You and Me? No. Yeah. Carlo Thomas, Sarah Borellis wrote a new version of it, which Good. is incredibly inclusive. It's beautiful. Oh, or Sarah Borellis, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, it was the anniversary of it, so they, they redid it. Um, Marlo Thomas, it was it's fantastic. 
Right. We can all Google that. So we can... Right. Yeah. It's, it's like, they took out even little parts about boys and girls. Yeah. So it's oh. children are free to be. Oh, with Marlo Tom, it's laughing. All right. I'm a huge that. fan. I have the LC at home. Okay. <laughs> All right. We got one action on it. We can get our kids singing that song. That's amazing. That's so good. We'll get the kids singing that song. Elizabeth had some wonderful scripture verses to set this up. And, and I know uh, Pastor Keith has talked about uh, the Gospel of Paul, but here's one that I like. You know, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus from Galatians, right? That we're all equal in the eyes of God. And, uh, you know, one thing we've done, I think, at, at UDLC is appreciate religious diversity, too. So David Grafton was a, a member here, director of graduate education at the Lutheran Seminary, an Islamic scholar. And I came back in the spring, and we visited a mosque, Chris and I, and, and uh, Diane and others. So, um, and what he'll tell you is, as he learns more about the Islamic faith, it strengthens his own faith as a Lutheran, which I thought was fascinating. So, um, this is the gospel according to uh, Libby Steffens. Has lavished on us that we should all be called children of God. We're all beloved children of God. And um, it's a lesson we, you know, we can't learn enough, I think. And then finally, for I am the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. So when, when we struggle, we hold God's hand. So Chris and I went to uh, visit her sister up in North Andover, Massachusetts. Now they do things different. Some of you have, have lived in Boston. <laughs> it's kind of a different culture there, which I like. I rode past this church. It's a, a UU church, Unitarian Universalist church. Uh, and on the front, right as you <laughs> enter, is, there's the pride flag. And right next to that is the sign that says, you are welcome in North Andover. And you see those signs all over North Andover. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a community message that you're trying to send. They're combating racism. Our faith calls us to affirm Black Lives Matters. So I think diversity, we can celebrate that, certainly in our work, because we know from research that better decisions are made, there's enhanced creativity, we're more responsive to our customers and business if we have diversity of the workforce. There are forces that work against that that we'll talk about <clears throat> in terms of bias. In our families, we love unconditionally. So we all know people in our family, or the LGBTQ community, we love them unconditionally. However, that's not always the case every single month. So I'm going to share with you a story. In our faith communities, we're called to embrace and celebrate our brothers and sisters in Christ since we're all beloved children of God. We know that all faith communities don't hold that true, particularly the white Christian nationalist evangelical community. You're not going to find that there. And we've seen some of this community as well. So I just wanted to share this story. It's a wonderful book written by a sociologist. The Heavy Burdens, Seven Ways LGBT Christians Experience Harm in the Church, Bridget Rivera, uh, sociologist, and uh, did it really as a, an academic work. But she interviewed over 24 members of the LGBTQ community. And this is one story that she begins with <laughs> that I think is very powerful. And think of it in any church that has like a, a women's group that we have them here at UDLC. So this is the setting in this particular church. And she writes, I squirmed in my seat, avoiding eye, avoiding eye contact with a woman in my small group. They offered encouragement to a woman sitting next to me. She spoke in halting sentences, wiping away tears with the tissue they offered. It's just awful, she said. You can't imagine. But I could. She was talking about her son, her gay son. And nobody knew that he was gay but me and her. She didn't even know that I knew. She didn't know that I knew he had a boyfriend. But he had just come out to her a day ago. She didn't know that I knew all about it. She didn't know that I am gay too. None of them did. He just needs prayer, she said. We learned some things about him yesterday. I can't go into the details, but he's falling away. I fingered the pages of my Bible nervously and found myself saying, your son loves Jesus. 
He really does. God will watch out for him. This is just terrible, Bridget, she said, eyes bleary and red. I can't say what it is, but it's just so bad. I'd rather have learned that he was dead. I'd rather have learned that he was dead. The words lingered in the air as I looked away. The ladies gave her hand a little squeeze. The mother went on about her family's despair. A woman volunteered to pray for her, and then we moved on. So that's real. Okay? That's a real story. And one, you know, we don't experience that here at UDLC, but it is happening outside of our church. <clears throat> so we're called, here's more data that she uh, offered in the book. Generations of LGBTQI plus people have been alienated or condemned by Christian communities. Religious faith reduces the risk of suicide for every demographic except LGBTQ people. This is especially true for youth, eight times more likely to attempt suicide if they experience family rejection, estimated that there are 1.8 million in this population. 40% of transgender adults have attempted suicide in their lifetime. 92% of that number before the age of 25. And this is this is really hit home to me. Of all the homeless youth, 40% are LGBTQ. They're not long, no longer feel welcome in their home. So now they're outside the home and homeless. So it's not enough to say, and, and uh, Jenny Anderson educated us all on this. It's not enough to say we're all welcome. All are welcome. We have to be called as disciples of Christ to proactively reach out to this community, the LGBTQI plus community and their families and their families. And we're beginning to do that. You know, see, um, Steph Jacobson, and Steph is here, but she's doing a wonderful job with the group that meets every other uh, Sunday at this hour. Right, a quick question before yeah. you go on. Could you go back to that bullet about the eight times more likely to attempt suicide? What's the 1.8 million number representing? Estimated 1.8 million what? Suicide attempts? 8.1 million uh, LGBTQ youth. Okay, okay. 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 Not that youth, they're okay. eight times more okay. likely in that population than the, than the uh, regular population. Yeah, just I just want to share the parable of Jesus and the lost sheep. So that's really kind of the biblical reference. It's it's uh, not enough to care for the ninety nine that are doing okay. It's the one that's left the flock that Jesus uh, tended to, so that all can experience God's love and support. So what's happening in our community? Well, we supported the Rainbow Room. We we're happy uh, to do that with the proceeds from the flea market. And uh, and they've gotten a big grant, so now they're expanding in Bucks County. They have another site in Langhorn, but that meets at the Salem uh, United Church of Christ in Doylestown. Um, we don't have anything comparable to the Rainbow Room in Montgomery County. I think there's another organization there, the Sage Group. That... Saga, but I think they're going through some discombobulation. Yeah, we don't have something like the Rainbow Room. Yes. So. Um, is a nice way to say. You know, there's the Reconciling Works group. That's a national group that we use for our uh, our process here. Uh, uh, our synod is, I think, providing wonderful leadership. Uh, and then at the national level, we you know had a pride event. Chris and I went to that. And I'll just pass around this brochure. I, Chris and I have just joined. Oh yeah, that one. Three mom hubs. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a wonderful group of mothers. We <clears throat> just organized to appear at these uh, community events. And um, I think there was a disability awareness thing at the Parkway the other day, and these mm -hmm. moms showed up at their table. And they had a table at the center, so I picked it up here. And now Chris and I are, are I'm not, I'm an honorary mom. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't say I couldn't join. <laughs> I'll let Chris give out the hugs. <laughs> She's very good at that. I would pick her up at no, school. No, no, no. You got yeah. time. <laughs> I'm going to tell the story. Good one. I won't. I won't. I'll be afterwards if you want to hear her. I listen. I'm going to respect her wishes. I'm not going to tell that story. But I do. I do think I admire the bishop for now coming out with this. It's a very powerful statement. It's a three-minute YouTube video. But I've always seen ELCA as kind of studying things to death. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have a task force and I'll meet for five years and yeah. they'll come up with a statement that nobody reads really. Mm -hmm. She's finally get out, gotten out in front and this, and I think it, it's a, a demonstration of wonderful leadership really? that we need uh, in this country. So I was happy to see that. I encourage you to just Google that and listen to it it's at your convenience. Okay, I'm just checking time. Why is all this important to us? Well, <clears throat> we have a long history of being a church of the community. I think there's a reason why we're Upper Dublin. Lutheran Church. You know, it's, uh, we have the community in the, in the name of our church. Our social ministries have long reflected that commitment and uh, wonderful outreach with One House at a Time and Chosen 300. The list goes on and on of being connected to the community in a significant way. And then we went through a comprehensive transition study where we established a goal to be more representative of the community and more responsive to their needs. Uh, and we committed to a goal to be an inclusive church in our strategic plan and to receive the Reconciling Christ designation, which we did. We went through the process, followed it step by step, and then received that designation in uh, last year. <laughs> and that's our team right there, a picture of our team with our welcome statement. I just want to go over, and we have t-shirts now that Thanks to Jenny. Yes, we're ready to the They're available. They are available. Chris <laughs> so, and I are going to the Jenkintown Arts Festival. We're going to wear our t-shirts <laughs> as uh, representing our church there. So this is our just an abbreviated statement of our welcome. To share the love of God by opening our hearts to all people in our community, celebrating and welcoming those with varied race, ethnicity, culture, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, relationship status, age, immigration status, nationality, neurodiversity, ability, language, economic circumstance, or family configuration, okay? So uh, in a way we are welcome to all, but we're being very specific about those communities that have felt that the church did not welcome them with open arms. So that's what we intend to do at UDLC. So I just wanna transition here and understand why this is a problem for many of us, and it's this uh, issue of unconscious bias. So how do we understand our bias? I tell uh, my students all the time, the beginning of wisdom is a confession of ignorance. The beginning of wisdom is a confession of ignorance. And there's actually a cognitive science term, the uh, uh, the Kruger effect, I think, where you don't, you don't really know what you don't know, right? Uh, let me get that right. The Dunning-Kruger effect, okay? And some people feel it's an existential threat to our society, really. There are so many ignorant people out there. Uh, I say it to Chris all the time, how can people be so stupid? I mean, it's, you know, it frustrates me. And yet, if I really believe in graceful engagement, I have to approach that community with grace, understanding, and patience, which I'm working on it. I'm working on it. But we all have some biases, right? I'm an old white male. So I'm gonna see things for the most part through that lens with old white male. Uh, affinity bias, like me. Thank God I didn't marry somebody like me because <laughs> Chris and I have great diversity with our marriage in terms of our opinions and perspectives. And, uh, uh, but, and we have, but we have great respect for each other. So um, that's a good thing. But when you're in the hiring mode, there's a tendency to hire people who are like me, the like me syndrome, right? Physical beauty is another bias that people have. Conformity, we're always searching for things that kind of support our perspective and not opening our eyes and our ears to other points of view. Racial and ethnic bias, we've been, uh, we're a product of our education and experience. We've been raised in a racist society that only in 1960s was able to um, really pass legislation to ensure equal opportunity. And we're still working to overcome decades and decades of discrimination and segregation. LGBTQ bias, really a lack of understanding and awareness is at the heart of that. Ageism, I'm, I'm feeling that a little bit now. <laughs> okay, so it's not as easy uh, to get things done and uh, or to get the supports that you need. And then ableism, which is a better way to say, uh, differently abled or disabled ableism, <laughs> but, but that includes neurodiversity, everything from developmental delays to autism and, and uh, people on the autism spectrum, ADHD, all the neurodiversity 
as well as physical challenges uh, that we face as well. So and I would add yeah. to that, like economic circumstances or classism. Mm -hmm. You know, there's yes. there's a great Netflix series recently called Made. I don't know if anybody saw that, mm -hmm. but it was about a woman who experienced um, mm -hmm. uh, domestic violence and wound up having to leave her home with her baby with mm -hmm. no credit card, no money, no car, no this, no that. Mm -hmm. And what she went through and as she went to different places where they should have been able to offer her help, she imagined in her mind what people were saying about her. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or she was going through the supermarket line using her food stamp card, mm -hmm. and she imagined that the clerk mm -hmm. was saying, white trash on aisle four, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. And so I, I think there's a lot of that. And we live in a privileged area. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So people have a certain idea about yes. if somebody's getting some kind of economic mm -hmm. help mm -hmm. it's their fault or they grew up that way or you know yeah. Yeah. so yeah. i see a lot of that mm -hmm. so i think you know we're all trying to do our best to um be aware of our bias some of us are working on that if we all would do that the world would be a better place i'm sure and the way to overcome that i think is to listen listen actively okay mm -hmm. to what a and try to see things from that affected person's perspective. How do you kind of walk a mile in their shoes would be the, the metaphor there. Uh, not always easy to do. And sometimes you need help. And those that are trying to help you need to be understanding and trusting that, hey, I'm, I'm trying to help you understand where I'm coming from, right? Or what my lived experience is. So, uh, and when you have that kind of conversation, you just need to be attentive and to listen, right? Not be defensive, right. but to listen. You know, Fred, I, this sounds so simplistic, but I just think we need to expand our understanding interpretation of the word family. Mm. Uh, you know, we are all a family. If people don't embrace the belief in a God, we're all a family in a common humanity. And, and I mean, that's that's the great equalizer for us. You know, some of us are people of faith. Some of us are questioning whatever or not. But we are all people of a common humanity. We're here on this planet together. And if we could look at that as our family rather than the people who sit around our table at Thanksgiving, where you know, I just feel like that 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 makes a difference. I mean, that's what we try to teach our children here at this church. Mm -hmm. We are all family everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh we believe we're all God's family. Mm -hmm. um, but for people who don't believe in a God. We are all family in a common humanity, right here on this planet, right? We're stuck here together. Right. Just so somebody just, um, pointed out to me kind of reason too that family sometimes isn't a problem. Family is sometimes not a problem. Not good. Good. So maybe it's an analogy that doesn't. So maybe that's not the best not word. Just saying, just saying. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe that's not a good point. Well, but no, but just that maybe yeah, um, maybe right. community. Community, yeah. 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 trust is, is, is yes, yeah. Um, maybe community is a better. Fred, you got to keep going with the time. time. Okay. Time. <laughs> yes, yeah. 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 Fred, it's about the time. Like it's better. Better be good now. Yeah. Get ready for us, Fred. Thank you for presenting, and thanks to the Dottie and Elizabeth for getting everything together for this program year and getting us underway. Thank so. you, I should say. And uh, thanks to John Israel for all the new furniture. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. First sure. chair, you can actually well, get in and out. Yeah. 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 Thank, thank you for this it. blessing. I appreciate yeah. you stopping by. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't want to take yeah, up. Yeah, I, just, <clears throat> I just purchased a book that came out this week by Oprah Winfrey and, and Brooks. And there's Arthur Brooks, I think, from Harvard. <clears throat> it's all about happiness. <clears throat> There are three things that are key to happiness. One is family. Okay. Uh, uh, so focus on family and friends, uh, really deep friendships uh, with people. And um, the third was spiritual connections. Uh, so if you have those three things, uh, you're on your on the way to happiness, at least based on the research and what they're. Oprah spent the uh, pandemic thinking about that question yeah. and reading uh, Arthur yeah. Brooks and then they got together and wrote a book. So I, I'm gonna, I haven't read the whole thing, but those are the, the main points. So anyway, we want to do training on this and you're all welcome once we get that going in 2024, we want to train the leaders of the church, the ministry leaders, uh, school teachers, Sunday school teachers and, 
and the day school teachers, how do we understand our bias? And we think a woman in Montgomery County, person of faith, who's the uh, executive director of diversity, equity, and inclusion, Karen Martin helped me find this person. We did some detective work and she's uh, not only willing to give freely of her time, but she has wonderful, wonderful expertise in this area and is working on her doctoral dissertation as well. So I think she'll do a wonderful job. Uh, so we can look forward to that sometime in 2024 once we get the date set. So let's talk a little bit in our remaining time. We've got maybe 15 minutes, Elizabeth, or 10 minutes. 10. Um, <laughs> 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 Some people like it. Right. Chris is keeping me on track here. Well, so you this, have so much. This, yeah. that we need part two, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I think any of this, give me feedback and we can go back and go on to a more depth. Absolutely. I think Dottie wants me to come back in the spring, so I'm ha happy yeah, to do that. But um, again, we learned about this through reconciling mm -hmm. Christ. And uh, it really involves the practice of grace, okay? Uh, the art of conversation uh, with compassion, respect, and engagement. In other words, you're committed to stay in this relationship that you've started with this person, this conversation. And I think part of part of the challenge for all of us that we're interacting at UDLC or, or strangers that we meet, we just don't know what their life story is and what they're bringing uh, to that conversation, what their perspective is. So you need to really probe that to understand kind of why they see the world the way they do. But you uh, need to have courage to ask the question, share with me why you feel this way, okay? Uh, and listen active, but share your truth and do it with love, okay? So a lot of times you'll get into these contentious conversations, there'll be some triggering words that people will say, and then we're not on the heads, right? That's happened to me, so I, I uh, I can confess to that. <clears throat> so, you know, you need to be patient, positive, skilled and active thinking, try to withhold judgment. But again, express your thoughts, but do it kindly and clearly. Uh, and then this idea of first seek to understand and then be understood. Right. Mm -hmm. That's just Stephen Covey, right. seven habit. Seek first to understand and then be understood. So I just want in the- Chris, can I just say one thing? Yeah. Though? The, the only thing, though, is that you are not obligated or required to stay in a conversation or, or a relationship that does you harm. Yeah. So yeah. you must yeah. be respectful, but you at any point can say, I am not comfortable with this conversation or I'm not the best person to have this conversation with you. And you can walk away. The most important thing is your well-being and your mental health. So no obligation to stay in something that causes you harm. Yeah. Yes. Oh, here's a good example. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we went uh, to the Pride Flag event in Upper Dublin high school, and we had a nice group uh, from our church uh, participate in that. Jenny was involved in that um, as well, and there was a protest. I don't have a picture of the protest. I don't have a picture of the Bible verse, but this was the message, homosexuality is sin, basically the message. And they were across the street. It's not like they were part of the celebration. They wanted to be part of the celebration. They were across the street in the parking lot. Of course, that's where I parked my car. <laughs> so Chris and I, I wanted to avoid this conversation at all costs. <laughs> of course, Chris couldn't help herself. <laughs> so she engaged with these two people, They're probably husband and wife. But Pastor. What? Pastor and congregant. Oh, 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 oh. Share oh, yeah. <laughs> so with you what you said. I don't remember the quotation they had on the signs. It was very general. It was like, um, I believe in Jesus Christ, or, you know. Anyhow, as I, I said to them, I love your poster and I completely agree with your poster. I love Jesus or whatever it said too. And um, he said to me, then how can you, did, did you read the Bible? And I said, yes. And he said, well, it says in the Bible that, um, you know, homosexuality is, is a sin and it's not permitted. I said, well, all I can tell you is that my God loves everyone. And um, he, he, she, he said to me, no, it can't be, you know, um, 
it plainly says so in the Bible. And I just came back to him and I said, well, you know, I don't know about your God, but my God accepts everyone and loves everyone. And then he, he motioned. So <laughs> <laughs> on our way somewhere. Yeah, I tried to say something uh, on Facebook was a good thing by Jimmy Carter, who is in my book right about yeah. Christians. He says, nowhere does Jesus ever say anything about homosexuality. Yeah. And so when somebody says that to me, because I have people in my family that are way far to the right, mm -hmm. and I just say, God loves everybody, mm -hmm. and nowhere in the Bible and does Jesus say anything about homosexuality? And it's true. There's nowhere in the New Testament about homosexuality. And, and, the, and the Old Testament, well, I don't know. The references in the Old Testament right. are generally about homosexuality that's being used as domination. Yeah. Because when a group of people would go, like, like you, th you hear of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the people wanted to sexual uh, have sexual relations with the men in, that were visiting um the one guy um lot and but that was a domination thing that's like when we take over we'll show who's in charge you're a stranger here you don't belong we're showing you who's in charge that kind of sexual abuse whether it's a male male or male female is wrong and that's been that is what's being condemned and it's always all the references to homosexuality in the in the uh Sorry, in the Hebrew scriptures. Sorry. Thank you. Are definitely um, it's it's aggressive. It's it's um, used as a domination and violence against other people. And when uh, and even like Isaiah refers to what happened in um, Sodom and Gomorrah and things like that. And it was always in terms of hospitality and greed and people not taking care of them. So yes, if you read it literally, it says it's not you should not have that, those relations. But it's not if you understand the context, it is mm -hmm. a violent type of action and a, an act of good clarification. Yeah. Right, five minutes. You've got to wrap okay. it up. Wrap it up. <laughs> Does it say the word homosexuality in in the Hebrew scriptures? Yeah, there are references. It, is, it doesn't say that word, does it? Homosexuality. Yes. Um, I don't think I so. Don't, I think that's I a think new, It's a modern translation. It's a modern yeah. translation. Okay. Yeah. 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 That word. In I, I forget. Yeah. But it, it's it, they do refer to male-male right. relationships, things like that. Um, and also female-female relationships. Actually, there are some references in the New Testament saying that's abnormal. But it's more when people are just doing that type yeah. of it and for mm -hmm. self-gratification. And it's not a love Right. Yeah, this, this is the start of our agenda for the DEI team. So uh, again, we want to support church council, provide advice. If there's a, an incident that happens or something, if we have somebody, if we have protesters at our church, then we want to be supportive and develop a, an approach or a strategy or have Chris talk to them. That would be, that would be one idea. Chris, I'll go with you. Again, we want to collaborate with the advocacy team. Chris is doing a wonderful job getting us organized there. So if there are opportunities, I know we still don't have a law in Pennsylvania that uh, uh, about discrimination against the LGBTQ community. It passed the House, but it's stuck in the Senate. Yeah. Right? So we need to continue to advocate for that. And, and uh, we'll collaborate on that and raise some issues. Uh, find other ways to connect with the community. So we're viewed as a resource, especially youth and families. I think what uh, Steph Jacobs is doing with this group is a great, great start. So how can we support, expand that? Maybe we reach out to the Rainbow Room and, and find out, is there an opportunity in Montgomery County for that to expand even further? Uh, and our church would be a logical place, I think, a great location, great facility. Uh, or the existing SAG, I guess the organization you mentioned. Yeah. There's other opportunities to collaborate. They have an open house coming up. I'm going to go to that just to find out what they're uh, they're all about. And then we have this big event. You're all invited, and you're invited to help us as volunteers as well. So it's uh, 9 o'clock to 2 o'clock, not a great big time commitment, but it's a great opportunity sponsored by our Synod. I think this is the fifth annual conference that they've had, the first time at UDLC. We presented last year, right? Um, Nancy, 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 Nancy,
Pastor Noah Heppy. Mm -hmm. right, so he's going to keynote. He was on Queer Eye for the Straight Guy he's on the Bravo that. Network. If you want to see that, you can find it on Netflix. But yeah, I think he's going to talk about these biblical passages and uh, ways that uh, there are other ways to view and interpret the Bible. So please come to that. Let me know, or Pastor Keith, if you want to volunteer. Uh, Chris and I are signed up to volunteer. And, and Steph and I are doing a workshop on Apocalypse. Great. So, yeah. And you're doing a workshop yeah. on that. Great. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks. So again, how, get back to this question. We want to continue to learn and grow. I suppose that's why you're here today, right? <laughs> you're adult learners. You want to continue to low, learn and grow and develop uh, your understanding. I We have a wonderful website of resource materials that uh, is there for additional reference. Uh, again, try to recognize and understand our unconscious bias, listen actively to the perspective of others, practice graceful engagement in our conversations, share our faith and our understanding with others, and remember uh, the gospel according to Libby Stephens. We're all coming. I love children. And one thing you can do is come next week. I'm sure you'll all be here to hear uh, Jimmy Clare, who's become a wonderful advocate. Mm -hmm. uh, for people with autism. So I'll just close with this quote me, from Be uh, Desmond Tutu, Bishop Desmond Tutu. We must embrace our differences, even celebrate our diversity. We must glory in the fact that God created each of us as unique human beings. God created us different so that we may recognize our need to be on a, a wonderful way to think about that. We must reverence in our uniqueness, reverence everything that makes us what and who we are. So thank you so much for coming and your attention and your, your conversation.